Uh, hi, welcome. Um, this is Yael Shacher from Refugees International. I'm just going to wait just one more minute before I get started. I see a lot of people joining, so just give me one more minute, and then um, we'll start the we'll start the this Voices from the Border event. Okay, thank you for all for attending. Um, this is, as I mentioned, um, a Voices from the Border event. This is a third in a series of Voices for, from the Border events that address policies of affecting those seeking protection at the southern U.S. border uh, and raise the voices of advocates and asylum seekers most affected by those policies. Uh, my name is Yael Shacher. I'm the senior U.S. advocate at Refugee at Refugees International, and I've been organizing this series. Um, you can watch tapings of our past um, two events on our website. Uh, this event is being taped as well, and it will be shared as well afterwards. Uh, and we'll be holding our next event later this summer. Um, if you have any questions or comments during today's panel, uh, please post them in the Zoom Q&A box. Um, and please identify yourself and to whom your question is addressed, uh, which panelist, that would be helpful. And we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the, uh, at the end of the panel. Um, this event is one we are co-hosting co with Human Rights Watch, um, which we collaborated with on a recent release report on the Gu Guatemala uh, US Asylum Cooperative Agreement. That agreement allows the United States to transfer non-Guatemalan asylum seekers, and so far it's been Hondurans and Salvadorans, from the U.S. border to seek asylum in Guatemala, just sort of a transfer from the U.S. border to Guatemala. Um, it's important to emphasize that this is just one of many policies put in place at the border restricting access to asylum in the United States. Um, we've held voices from the border events on some of the other policies, in fact, such as the Remain in Mexico policy that sent people to wait in Mexico until their court hearings um, came up in the United States. Um, the screenings given to asylum seekers at the border under the Guatemalan asylum cooperative agreement, the eight, I'll just refer to it as the ACA or the GACA, Guatemalan ACA, um, are sort of just as cursory as under the Remain in Mexico policy. Um, asylum officers do not ask asylum seekers um, being considered for transfer to Guatemala, whether they fear persecution or torture in Guatemala. Um, if the asylum seeker sort of independently asserts that fear, um, the resulting screening interview with an asylum officer is still like to result in their transfer to Guatemala because of an unreasonably high evidentiary standard that essentially nobody in practice can actually meet. Most cre uh, crucially, the asylum seekers are never really given a chance to present evidence of persecution in their home countries, why it is that they are actually seeking asylum in the United States, nor have their fears of return to their home countries or the evidence of their persecution in the home countries assessed at the U.S. border. Um, this is tragic because transfer to Guatemala is, as the title of the report, uh, you know, RI and Human Rights Watch put out, it's just a layover uh, with little protection and transferees end up getting returned to their home countries or returning to their home countries. Um, Around the same time, transfers of asylum seekers to Guatemala, Guatemala under the ACA picked up. The U.S. was also implementing other programs, um, anti-asylum programs at the border, one called PACER, uh, which featured sort of prolonged border patrol custody under poor conditions, sped up asylum screenings, and limited access to counsel in ways that are somewhat similar to what happens to the people under the Guatemalan Asylum Cooperative Agreement as well. And our first two speakers today, Ariana Sawyer, the U.S. Border a researcher for Human Rights Watch, and Linda Corchado, Director of Legal Services at Las Americas Advocacy Center in El Paso, will speak specifically to those issues. Um, I emphasize that this um, ACA policy with Guatemala 
Guatemala, between the U.S. and Guatemala, is an, is an enforcement policy because there's been an effort uh, by the administration to sort of present it as a safe third country agreement. And U.S. law allows for the signing of such agreements um, with countries that are actually safe and that have full and fair asylum procedures um, such that if the U.S. actually sends people there, there is no risk of violating the international and U.S. legal obligation of non-refoulement or the return of an asylum seeker to a place where his or her life or freedom is threatened and or threatened with persecution. Before signing the agreement with Guatemala, El Salvador, El Salvador and Honduras, these asylum cooperative agreements, and only the Guatemalan one has actually been implemented, but others have been signed. Um, the U.S. had only one other such asylum transfer agreement with Canada, uh, though that agreement is different because it actually includes exceptions for people with family members in the U.S. and calls for monitoring, monitoring by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to ensure against non reform um, and these do not exist under the Guatemalan Asylum Cooperative Agreement. And Rachel Schmitke, um, the Latin America Advocate for Refugees International, will speak about what actually happens to asylum seekers after they are transferred from the U.S. border to Guatemala. What we found in our research is that almost all transferees truly fear persecution, could not really seek protection or gain effective protection in Guatemala and felt compelled to abandon their claim. And this comes across really palpably in the case of Maria Isabel, a Salvadoran GACA transferee whose video testimony we'll also share uh, at the end of the panel. On the last two remarks I have to say is that GACA is part of a toolkit of enforcement policies at the border. Like others, it traumatizes asylum seekers, separates them from family members, and sends them to potential danger. Um, GACA, like these other policies, has been suspended because of the COVID-19 um, crisis. And instead, an even blunter instrument of expulsion is being used at the U.S. border right now, such that those seeking protection are not even getting any screening at all, um, all under the guise of sort of a public health authority. But there is a danger that GACA, this, uh, this asylum cooperative agreement, or the similar agreements with Honduras, uh, the similar agreement with Honduras is sort of waiting in the way things um, could be implemented at any time. So our goal was to write a report, have this event, and try to make sure that this agreement is seen for exactly what it is, which is the shirking of the obligation to protect, the sending of asylum seekers to a place where they have no good options, and losing track of them um, to a risk of real harm. Um, many others are raising the same alarm as we are. Uh, Georgetown Law Human Rights Institute is about to release a report based on a trip to Guatemala that raises a lot of the same concerns as ours. This squad, the network in solidarity with the people of Guatemala, is, is doing an ongoing campaign and has an upcoming webinar on the ACA with Guatemalan partner organizations. There is litigation here in the United States spearheaded by the ACLU, the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies, and the National Immigrant Justice Center, and others challenging the ACA's in federal court. And I know that there are many in the audience from Guatemalan civil society, human rights monitors who have felt the strain and basically carried the weight of this policy. Uh, there are some in attendance that work with UNHCR and the IOM that are concerned with the challenges the ACA pose for international protection in the entire hemisphere. Um, and GACA rolled out, you know, shrouded in secrecy with a lack of transparency and a troubling lack of monitoring of what ultimately happens to those transferred under it. Our goal with this report and with all of your help is to document and raise up what, is ha what has happened to the almost 1,000 people so far transferred under this agreement uh, so as to show why it is so important to prevent its re-implementation or to roll out in other countries that are even less able to provide refuge than Guatemala is. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ariana, who will take us sort of the U.S. border side of this agreement. Thank you so much, Yo. Uh, so again, I'm Ariana Sawyer, the U.S. border researcher for Human Rights Watch. Um, as we talk about the various abuses associated with this program, I just want folks to remember that we're talking about human beings who often feel that they've used the last of their energy reserves and financial re financial reserves to to arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border and seek asylum. So. These asylum seekers, many of whom are families, um, arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border after what can be a long and harrowing journey through Central America and Mexico, 
when they reach U.S. territory. It's worth noting that folks typically sit and wait for or flag down U.S. border agents. Um, they think they've made it to some semblance of safety. Um, to begin with, under U.S. and international law, when asylum seekers express a fear of return to their country of origin, they're supposed to be given a special screening by a U.S. asylum officer that protects them from even the possibility of being returned to persecution or torture. Um, but as Yael said, when the asylum seekers we spoke to expressed a fear of return to their country of origin, they were flatly denied any opportunity whatsoever to tell their story. Uh, some asylum seekers told us they brought thick stacks of documents or like a binder full of proof, like police and hospital records, photographs of injuries, um, but they weren't able to, uh, they weren't allowed the opportunity to show U.S. officials any of that proof. Instead, they were placed into this illegal program, ultimately sending asylum seekers to Guatemala with a five-year ban uh, on returning to the United States. So almost everyone I spoke to had family members in the United States who could have supported them or sponsored them while they pursued their asylum claims um, safely. So there's also this element of, of family separation to all of this, you know, so people are facing like this five-year ban, they're not gonna be able to see their family members again for some time. To make matters worse, uh, before being sent to Guatemala, Customs and Border Protection is subjecting asylum seekers to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment in border jails. So to show you all what I mean, I'm going to uh, try to tell the story of, of one family's experience, as many of the things they told us echo the experiences of the other asylum seekers we spoke to. Um, a woman I'll call Manuela arrived at the border with her 17 and 11 year old sons. So the family had fled Honduras after um, an attempt, the attempted forced gang recruitment of her eldest son. And uh, gang members ultimately threatened to kidnap her younger son from school if the family didn't pay a weekly extortion. They had tried, like before they fled, they had tried to move around Honduras four different times, but continued to receive serious threats. So in the end, they felt they had no choice um, but to flee. Um, though they brought proof of the persecution they'd experienced, they were never allowed to present it. Instead, they were told they could express a, a fear of return to Guatemala. I mean, they would they would have to express an affirmative fear of return to Guatemala, a country that fails to provide asylum seekers with effective protection, we found. Um, so during their fear screening, the US official in charge of interviewing this family reportedly told them, didn't you know that in the US they aren't giving asylum anymore? Um, the family was separated by border agents while they were in custody. Uh, agents put the teenager in a cell apart from his mother and younger brother. And we documented repeated reports of such separations. Um, although people are supposed to be detained for no longer than 72 hours in border detention facilities, because those facilities are frankly not equipped to house people for even short-term care, let alone long-term care, uh, the family was detained for 11 days in a freezing cold tent facility where they spent every night shivering, witnessed verbal abuse by CBP agents, were never allowed outside, not even children, were given frozen or undercooked food, did not have free access to the restroom, and were given a shower only once or twice the entire time. Uh, plus, they lacked access to other personal hygiene necessities, like brushing your teeth or you know, these types of things. So mind you, all of this was happening in the context of the spread of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I'll post a link to, the, to a formal complaint made to the Department of Homeland Security's internal watchdog agency regarding CBP detention conditions given the COVID-19 outbreak in the chat for um, those of you who would like to learn more. Um, so when I first met this family, Manuela's older son's arm was in a sling and he carried with him an unfulfilled prescription for antibiotics to treat an infection he developed in detention. He had injured his arm in the process of crossing the Rio Grande, the river that lies between the US and Mexico and was in an incredible amount of pain uh, despite repeated requests for medical care while they were detained, border agents ignored him. Finally, after begging and pleading, his mom shouted at border agents, uh, telling them that she was going to file a complaint and try to sue them if they didn't help her son. And so um, they finally took him to a hospital where he wound up needing a uh, surgical reconstruction of his clavicle. Um, so border agents never allowed him to fill the prescription that doctors gave him, instead sending the family on an airplane to Guatemala City Despite the fact that one of the secret annexes to the agreement states that people who recently had serious injuries or surgery were not eligible for transfer. Um, another of the serious abuses associated with this program is the utter lack, of, total lack of access to counsel, which I'll let my colleague Linda talk more about. 
But I'll just say that in all of this, um, four agents were, they only allowed asylum seekers to have like one or two phone calls, just a few minutes each. They were super rushed. Um, and they were essentially told like, you choose, you call your family or you can call a lawyer. Um, and I think with that, I'll turn it over to Linda. Thank you, and I, I'm so grateful to be here and, and speak with all of you. Um, I'm the Director of Legal Services here at Las Americas, and we are very much strategically um, positioned on the U.S.-Mexico border to respond to really two ongoing crises that I think help us, especially in this case, provide representations to persons who have been placed into ACA. That would be both MPP and the Heart Pacer program that was um, briefly touched on before, um, and I'll give you an example of, of how that's the case. We met, my colleagues at Las America met Josue from at Ciudad Juarez. He was an asylum seeker from Honduras who um, was persecuted on the grounds of his sexuality. And he was just trying to get some more information. He was being metered and he expected that soon enough when his number would be up, he would um, be placed into MPP and seek asylum. We thought it was a very strong case, but I was still on guard, um, unsure if he would be placed into another CBP program. There's a lot of unknowns that happen when someone presents themselves at the port of entry. Um, we had asked him to please call us once his number's up and he's no longer, in, in, it's time for him to present his case um, to CBP agents at the port of entry. I didn't hear anything, so I knew that his number was up at least, and I, I reached out to CBP to try and set up a legal call. Um, it was not until several days later when I was able to finally make contact with him. He told me that as soon as he went to the port of entry, all of his documents were confiscated, one of them being um, my G28, which is the, the notice that I'm his attorney of record. Um, which also meant that he didn't know my number now, he didn't know how to reach me during this critical point. Um, when he was before these agents at the port of entry, they notified him quite quickly that it's very likely he would be placed into ACA and that he just had to sign some documents um, in order to kind of cement that placement. Of course he refused. Um, he kept insisting he had an attorney, he wanted to speak with me to discuss what was going on. And CBP agents just, just flat out denied that opportunity. Um, and they said that I really have no standing at the port of entry, which is the case. Um, he was then, he, again, he was refusing to sign. He said, I don't feel comfortable. He didn't even understand all of what was included in these documents. Then agents basically asked for reinforcements. More CBP agents entered, to, entered the room. They said, look, if you sign this or if you don't sign this, you're going to be sent to Guatemala. So do yourself a favor. Um, this caused a lot of intimidation and anxiety for him. And he signed, hoping that I would be able to get around this at some point when he would be able to contact me. We finally speak when he's transferred over to Border Patrol Station 1. This is where a lot of persons um, have their fates decided by CBP agents where I have no legal access, no physical access. The most I can do is request legal calls to speak with them. Um, once he's there, he told me he actually felt kind of confident or, or comfortable with the situation because he was in a barracks where other persons who were also placed into ACA were there. So they basically gave him the rundown. They said, look, you're gonna have an interview. Um, they're gonna ask you about Guatemala, be sure to let them know why you're afraid. Um, some of them thought he would get out of ACA, right? Because he's gay and, and he's clearly had a lot of issues. Guatemala is, is not known for protecting um, gay persons that, that live there. I would know, I represent many of them here um, when they make it to the US. So he was dumbfounded when he was finally called to this interview, an interview that I was not notified on, I was not included, I was not able to be a part of, um, and no one asked him anything about Guatemala. And so this caused a lot of unknowns for him because he thought, well, maybe I'm no longer in the ACA program. Um, maybe I'm in another program. Maybe I'm going to be sent to MPP or maybe I'll be detained. Um, and what was also difficult on my end is that it was very difficult to understand what was happening procedurally. I would reach out to USCIS. I would ask them what's going on. Was this, what was this interview? 
um, they completely pass the buck to CBP. For Heart Pacer, for example, when I want an interview transcript, when I want to represent them, they're very forthcoming, but in this case, they were not. CBP was also confused as to why USCIS was not forthcoming. Um, so then CBP, all that they would say was, this individual is scheduled to be put on a flight to Guatemala in like three days. Um, and so I was just completely dumbfounded by the whole experience. And I just, all that I need to do was basically assert that my client was afraid of being transferred to Guatemala, made that very clear to CIS and, and to the CBP agents. Finally, he was scheduled for an interview. Um, he told me, you know, so-and-so just, this agent just called me. They said to be ready for this interview. Um, again, I wasn't included or a part of it. And I didn't even get the results. Instead, as I kept trying to make contact and set up interviews with my client, I was finally able to put two and two together when CBP agent said, you can't speak with this individual. He's now on a plane to Guatemala. Um, once he got there, he, we started messaging. Um, he was stranded. He had no idea what to do. He was he did spend some time in a migrant shelter, but in that shelter, other migrants were telling him gay people are not welcome here. Um, even out on the streets, that happened. He was persecuted at a local bar um, and fell off a motorcycle. He still had visible scars when that happened. All of these events were extremely stressful, and especially for me, right, where I'm in a situation where I could provide some relief, I could allow someone to, I could facilitate the process to help them seek asylum. But in this case, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know how to connect the dots for him. Finally, I was able to reach out to an NGO group in Guatemala and in Mexico. Um, and we were able to coordinate his, his ability to go to the Mexican border and seek asylum in Mexico. We just spoke a few days ago. He um, suffered an attempted kidnapping from Mexican police officers. Um, they were making a lot of derogatory uh, names um, and for specifically referencing his sexuality. He's told me many times, when you see me, you know I'm gay, and that's basically my death sentence. So it, it's now, that's, that's all he's got. Now he can show he has suffered persecution in Guatemala. He has suffered persecution in Mexico. And his goal is still to seek asylum here in the United States. And that would have been a case that here at Las Americas, we would have taken in a heartbeat. He had relocated in Honduras. He had suffered persecution by cops when he was holding the hand of his partner. He was then beaten by cops. This is a case that we would have taken um, and now it, it's just, it's such an impossible feeling to see someone be rejected by so many countries, knowing that we were the first country to, to close the door on him. Um, just want to quickly touch on two other issues, which is the chaos and implementation when it comes to ACA. Um, I spoke with one man who had called me at Border Station 1. He said he was placed into MPP. He was given a notice for his next court hearing. This was after he was being metered, of course. And then about 10 minutes later, he's moved to another room. He's, the, the court notice is taken away from him and he's placed into ACA. Um, probably one of the most troublesome cases was of a woman who was eight months pregnant with her three-year-old. Um, and we got a hold of her through her sister who lives here in El Paso. Um, and her common law husband was separated from her. He was placed into MPP. She was then still held in CBP. Um, and then she was told that she was placed into ACA and she would be transferred to Guatemala. All of this stress and anxiety um, induced contractions and she was sent to an emergency room. And early the next morning she was released and now she's here living in the United States. Um, and she's got her next court hearing in, in non-detained as well. Um, that, that was very troublesome because she's visibly pregnant and the fact that they would just keep causing all this kind of stress to her um, was very troublesome for us. Um, finally, just wanted to touch on the fact that we're constantly strategizing here at Las Americas to try and see how can we continue to rise to the occasion and, and help folks. Um, in a second, I'll, I'll share with you a video that, that we were able to do in collaboration with Hyas. Um, and 
the goal is to create something that, that we can send to more folks when we meet them into the Juarez when they're trying to seek asylum and let them know, look, these are all of the things that can happen to you when you're placed, when, you're, when you come into contact with a CBP agent. And one of them is ACA. And these efforts are taken because we just feel so strongly that, that no one knows what will happen to them. The most important screenings happen at a port of entry where I have no access. They can't even make a call to me. Um, so that's just one way that advocates are, are trying to look at this situation and, and be of service to, to the most vulnerable persons we believe in. Um, and I'll also share with you um, a, a press release from the ACLU. Uh, Las Americas is also plaintiffs in that suit where um, the ACLU is helping us dismantle this, this awful program that now Honduras is a part of. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to Rachel. Thank you all for the opportunity. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel schmidt -Key. I'm the Latin America Advocate for Refugees International. And I'm going to pick it up um, when the Guatemala, sorry, the Honduran and Salvadoran asylum seekers arrive in Guatemala. I'm going to refer to them as transferees just so it's a little easier. Um, that's basically because they've been transferred from the U.S. to Guatemala and not, not returned because they didn't necessarily have to go through Guatemala to be sent there. Um, so I'll just refer to them again right now as, as transferees. So when these uh, Honduran and Salvadoran transferees arrive in Guatemala, they're thrust into a really high pressure, high stress, very traumatic situation. We spoke with um, some people who had been shackled for 12 hours straight um, along their wrists, their waist, their ankles. And keep in mind, these are asylum seekers. There's no need for them to be shackled, let alone for 12 hours on a plane. Um, so they arrive, they are sent to the um, Air Force hangar, and that's where the Guatemalan immigration officials are waiting for them to essentially register them quickly um, upon arrival in Guatemala. Many didn't know they were in Guatemala until they arrived. Most of them were under the assumption that they could continue their asylum process in the United States just from Guatemala. So after Guatemala, um, the Guatemalan immigration officials register these transferees, essentially the Guatemalan government washes their hands of these people. They say, okay, you have 72 hours to decide. You'll be sent to a civil society organization that will take care of you for the rest of the time here. And I just want to emphasize that the 72 hours that people are given to make a monumental decision about their future is absolutely arbitrary. People are allowed to be in Guatemala if you are a Honduran or Salvadoran legally for 90 days without a passport because all three countries are signatory to a passport agreement or a border agreement there. So the 72 hours is essentially a strategy to push people to decide something very quickly and put them in, under a high stress situation and effectively compel them to abandon their asylum claims and go home. So once um, the people go to the civil society organization, which is called Refugio de la Niñez, which essentially means children's shelter. And um, this organization, keep in mind, is has a mandate that is far beyond just the ACA transferees. They, they provide services to a ton of different vulnerable um, populations in Guatemala. And so they're stretched essentially to, to their breaking point because they're having to assume not care for another vulnerable population that they had no say in uh, whether these people were going to get sent to Guatemala or not. So our transferees that we spoke to when they arrived at Refugio, they said, this is the first time that we feel like we're being treated like human beings. It was the first time that they were explained that they had to, um, if they wanted to apply for asylum, that it was going to be in Guatemala and not in the U.S. They're given access to lawyers, uh, social workers, psychologists, but Again, the civil society organizations are operating with a limited budget, and it's not really their responsibility to be taking care of these people. They're doing so almost out of the goodness of their hearts, in a sense. Um, and uh, the civil society organization, Refugio, gives them a better understanding of the three options that people have while they're in Guatemala during these 72 arbitrary hours, which is they can apply for asylum in Guatemala, they can apply for a temporary residence card, or they can go home. And so, these three options are all just a series of bad options for um, Honduran and Salvadoran transferees. The Guatemalan asylum system, I don't want to get too technical with it. I'll just sort of explain briefly some of the, it's, it's a very clunky um, bureaucratic system and it's really not designed to have high number, high volume of claims every year. The Guatemalan asylum system was receiving less than 50 asylum claims a year up until 2014. And following that, the numbers have been pretty minimal if you compare them to like the United States. But even with those minimal numbers, there's a, a 
huge backlog, like 700 cases that haven't been processed. And none of the people, only 20 people have applied for asylum of the 940 that got sent through the ACA. And of those 20 people, no one has had their claim processed, meaning that they're still waiting in Guatemala for a decision of whether they can actually be, receive asylum or be granted refugee status in the country. And during that time, they're not guaranteed necessarily access to a job, healthcare, childcare. The majority of people that are sent there are women with children and young children. We saw babies in this in this shelter in the Casa de Migrante. And so even if you know they wanted to apply for asylum and stay in Guatemala, who's gonna watch their kids? They have no one, no social support, no social networks in this country. And so I think the bigger issue though is that the majority of transferees in Guatemala don't want to apply for asylum or temporary residency. And this is because they view Guatemala as the same as their home countries. They say, I feel no different here than I would do in El Salvador or Honduras. The same gangs in my home country are also in Guatemala. So why is this a country in any way safer for me to stay here? And it's true, Guatemala is, cannot really afford them the protection that, that the United States could. And the asylum seekers know this. They understand that Guatemala is not the place where they wanna stay because they say, at least in my home country, I know it's dangerous, but I have family there. If something happens to me, someone will know that I'm in danger. At least I have someone to reach out to. In Guatemala, something happens, no one knows me. Um, and so that's, that's just a really tragic situation where people are under an incredible amount of stress. They have very little options for information, that access to information, access to counsel, and to make a really difficult decision. Um, and I just want to share one story of an asylum seeker. I'll call him Freddie. He's a 19-year-old boy. Um, and I'll say boy because a 19-year-old truly is a child still. I know that they're above 18, but I can't imagine making a decision at 19 like this. And he his sister had been kidnapped by gang members, essentially. A gang member was keeping her as his woman, which is not a voluntary decision. I'll just say that if, if you know anything about gangs in, El Salvador, in Honduras and El Salvador. She eventually fled to the United States because of the trauma that she had endured at the hands of gangs members. Freddie's little brother had his life mutilated um, by a machete by gang members who were angry that the sister had fled to the United States. And so, the little brother also fled to the United States. Both siblings um, sought asylum along with their father who already had an asylum case pending in the US. So all three of them are in the United States. Freddie receives death threats from the gangs and decides, okay, I'm gonna go to the United States as well to be with my family. Unfortunately, he left after the ACA had been implemented. And so instead of being able to join his family in the United States, he sent to Guatemala as a 19 year old. He was having panic attacks. He couldn't stop crying in the shelter. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. My family is all in the States. If I go back to Honduras, they'll kill me. And he had no options. Guatemala was not an option for him. Of what we assume is that the majority of people um, who haven't applied for asylum have gone home. We can only say definitively that 44 people have returned home because they went through the IOM's Assisted Voluntary Return Program. The other remainder of people, there's no formal tracking of where they go. We have no idea if they returned to their home country, if they went to Mexico, if they um, were victims of a crime along the journey, and if they returned to the same violence that they fled from, which is likely. Um, and so it's really just a tragic situation where because we have no follow-up or no idea, people could be returning to their deaths and, that's and the United States has not afforded them truly an effective or viable solution for them. Um, and so I just wanna end with that. We're, the panelists here, we're lucky that we've been able to keep in touch with a few asylum seekers. We know that two have gone back to El Salvador, one is in, Hunter, uh, is in Mexico. And um, so the, one of the asylum seekers, her name is Maria Isabel. She's in El Salvador now, but she was subject to the ACA, the ACA and um, has graciously shared a video with us of her experience in CBP custody and in Guatemala. So I'll turn my, I think we should all turn our attention now to the video and I'll end my time there. Thank you. Y pedí asilo y no me, no me dieron la oportunidad de, 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 poder presentar las, las pruebas ni nada, solo me dijeron que, que eran dos opciones, me mandaban para Guatemala o para El Salvador y de ahí que desde ahí de Guatemala iba a pelear el asilo y eso era mentira, pura mentira nos dieron porque cuando llegamos a Guatemala ahí nos explicaron de que, de que no pues 
que era para pedir asilo era para Guatemala, no para, para Estados Unidos. Y yo no firmé deportación, solo así me mandaron. Cuando preguntamos que para dónde íbamos, nos salió bien, bien enojado el, un, el de migración. Nos, 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 tra, nos ultrajó pues porque antes de salir, porque cuando yo, yo le pregunté para dónde vamos, me, me salió bien, bien enojado. Y entonces cuando llegamos a Guatemala, de ahí nos, nos llegamos a, a emigración ahí. Y nos hicieron las preguntas, nos dijeron que sí del asilo. Y le presentamos, a, nos dieron los papeles y me dijeron no, de ahí no. Es, eso no es, es para quedar acá, nos dijeron. Y, te, y si ustedes quieren para estar acá en Guatemala, ¿no? Ten, tienen 72 horas para, para poder pedirlo. ¿no? Pero igual yo no, no tenía familia ahí. Mi familia está aquí en El Salvador, no podía. Y entonces me tocó regresarme, ver cómo prestaba dinero para poderme venir, porque no traía ni cinco, ni, ni un dólar, nada. Y entonces me tocó prestar para poder viajar para, para El Salvador. Y, y entonces para llegar acá a casa, Ahorita mis planes es que pase todo esto, primero Dios, esta, de, de esta crisis que está pasando todos estos países de, del, del el coronavirus y poder, poder salir a trabajar, por ver cómo consigo trabajo porque ahorita no tengo ni trabajo ni nada para ver cómo puedo seguir pagando mis deudas que tengo porque yo pago una casa. Tengo, tengo mis dos hijos y eso es mi plan es poder trabajar y como yo y salir adelante and I just wanna this is Yael Shakur again um, I just wanted to say something about the video and you know what she didn't say but you may have been able to infer from her body language in the video about what she said when she got home um, and what she told us when we interviewed her at the um, Casa de Migrante in Guatemala City is why she actually left El Salvador to begin with and it had to do with domestic violence um, and she didn't really talk about that on the video but there were a couple of women who we talked to that talked to us about that um, and um you know uh I, I don't think that was something she felt comfortable sharing um but that's the hard thing here um i think one of the issues is the idea that there were there people are really returning to some real risk um and it's a very desperate situation with really really um, no good options um no good options there um and and uh, Maria Isabel actually was one of the people who we interviewed who showed us some evidence of that. She had been she had a restraining order, which she showed us, um, and she was one of the one of the people that told us that she also had some trouble. Um, you know, CBP would not let her present that documentation again at the border. Um, and so this is this is a situation where, and again, as as Rachel mentioned, I mean, we don't really know what's happened to most people. Um, and even the people that we do know, like Maria Isabel, um, we don't exactly know how much danger she's in right now. Um, we can only hope for the best, but this is not, this is not um, a viable situation. And the lack of monitoring about what's happened to the vast majority of the people returned is really problematic. Um, I think, um, um, unless the, any of the other panelists want to add a few words, I'll open it up for questions. Any of the other panelists want to say something? I'll just mute myself for a minute, just in case. Okay, I, I think I'll turn to some of the questions. Um, the first one, um, I'm going to just, let me, let me just read them quick, real quickly. Um, 
Okay, I'll start. I think this is one really for the entire panel. So I'll start with this one. Um, and the question is, if the agencies overseeing our asylum process are disregarding the laws so blatantly, what response is available to us beyond simply bringing legal action? And again, I think that legal action is referring to the litigation that Linda spoke about and, and that I mentioned in the introduction. Um, just wondering how to respond to this in a way that would make a difference. Um, and, you know, I, I guess my, my response is, you know, this is something that, you know, in our report, we, we called for, um, you know, more congressional oversight over this. And I, I, I do say there's a, there's a ray of light in the fact that many of the asylum officers um, themselves are quite opposed to having having to do the interviews as they as they come out in the border and are actually involved in the litigation as well. But why don't I let the other panelists um, field this question? Why don't we go in order in which the way we spoke? So Ariana, Linda, and then Rachel, uh, whoever wants to respond, we'll go in that order. Yeah, so I think congressional oversight is really an important key here. Um, I think um, you know U.S. Uh, residents can lobby their members of Congress and raise this issue with them and let them know that this is really important that they care about this issue. Um, I also think that there's there's a little bit of um, advocacy to be done on the you know like Guatemalan side, right? So we've seen the country of Guatemala pause this um, agreement during the COVID-19 pandemic and. I think it's really difficult. I recognize that it's really difficult given the, the amount of uh, financial and political pressure the United States can mount against um, Northern Triangle countries, but I think it's so important um, not to be complicit in human rights violations of like blatantly, like blatantly abusive policies like this. And if, if, if that you know, freeze can just be continued forever, I think that that would be useful as well. Um, you know, on my side, I think knowledge is power. And, and so when you look at this, this highest video that I shared with everyone, we did it and I'm so glad that, that um, we have the support of HIAS because it, it's so important that asylum seekers be informed of what's at stake and, and what's happening because so many of the persons that I did speak with who were at CBP thought, okay, I guess Guatemala is like Mexico, and then I can then seek asylum, U.S. asylum from Guatemala, and, and that's just not the case. Just so many other issues where, where knowledge is power, but is it really though, right? Um, that you have to meet such a high standard. Like when Josue passed through Guatemala, he was in a hotel he did, in order to get to Mexico in his hopes to get to the United States. He did not even get out of that hotel because he knew that he would be persecuted there, um, which then caused problems for him during his interview because he was not actually persecuted. So I, I do think, you know, in a larger way, in a more meaningful way, Americans need to understand what asylum is and how important it is and, and that it's, it's a privilege for our country to be able to give asylum to, to others. Um, you know, last summer we had a lot of staffers come to El Paso to, to try and figure out what was going on with CBP and, and Heart Pacer and MPP. Um, and as we're doing it, I, I always communicated to them, I really feel like the work that immigration attorneys do is, is patriotic. We are espousing democratic values all over and we are protecting people with what we believe in, right? It, the, the sanctity of, 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 of marriage and that could be marriage between two gay persons. That, that's something that is a beautiful thing in this country and, and yet we're turning our, our, our backs towards the most vulnerable people. So, I mean, I am a part of a 501c3 so I can't say too much about it, but I think your voice matters. And if, if you are upset about the way that immigrants are being treated, um, you have to vote and, and also show, express that um, confoundment to, to, your, to persons in power um, because that's, that's really important to us. Here, we're, we're just at the beck and call of, of whatever the Trump administration wants to do. We need to be constantly responsive. Um, but, but there's a lot to say as well to, to what Ariana said. I mean, the, we felt so betrayed by Mexico, right? When we saw MPP, we're like, how could, me how could Mexico agree to something like this? 
then we see Honduras and now we see Guatemala. I mean, the power that the US government has over these countries is so great. Um, but there's, there's so much value, I think, for countries to say enough. There's so much value in CBP agents to say, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna pressure these people. I'm not gonna treat, dehumanize the um, asylum seekers as well as um, asylum officers. So everyone has some, some sort of agency. The problem is no one is, is really using it. Uh, I agree completely with Linda and Ariana, what they said about you know calling Congress and raising your voice. I think that's incredibly important. One thing I will say is that this particular policy, and I think the last few that have rolled out under the Trump administration, it's a very complicated issue. And there's been so much secrecy around it that I think even just having some knowledge and understanding that this is going on. You know, I think I remember, you know, last year when people were outraged about family separation, you know, those, those same issues are continuing now. And I think it's becoming harder to, to find that information and to understand what's going on, which is why I think events like this are very important, but, you know, tuning in and, and really plugging into this, these issues and understanding that they haven't gone away um, just because they're not necessarily flagged in the media all the time. Um, and I want to also flag that, I think right now we have a very unique opportunity because the ACA has been halted in Guatemala and it hasn't been rolled out in Honduras or Salvador yet. So I just want to say that, you know, raising your voice right now, calling Congress, posting on Twitter, you know, anything you can do, all of those things are really important at this moment in time because we do have an opportunity to make sure that these, this agreement does not continue and it does not get rolled out in, in Honduras or El Salvador, which frankly those two countries are or even worse in terms of danger than Guatemala is. So we really don't want that to happen. And one final thing I think on the Guatemalan side is that when this whole agreement got rolled out, the Guatemalan Constitutional Court initially put a hold on it. And that was because this agreement needed to go through the Congress of Guatemala to be ratified. A bunch of stuff happened and basically they circumvented that ruling. But really, I think that Guatemalans, hopefully, you know, and, I, and there's some people here in attendance from Guatemala, from the Human Rights Abusement and Fufuja La Niñez, um, you know, it would be great to leverage some of your voices as well to ask that this agreement be reviewed actually by the Congress and not um, circumvented, as I mentioned. So uh, yeah, those are my answers. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, this one's from Debbie Kang. Hi, Debbie. Uh, I know Debbie from way back, um, who, who is a professor at, at UT Dallas and a fellow at UCSD. Um, wants to know how many um, if people process under ACA were also waiting for an asylum hearing under MPP. And I think Linda can best handle that one, but you're kind of put in one or the other. Um, so that I don't think is that much of an issue. And Linda, you can correct me if I'm wrong um, after that. And then the one other thing is that, she, um, and I'll, I, I can answer this one too, Debbie's interested, and I think this is a really good question, um, about the differences in implementation of the ACA between various ports of entry. Uh, and I could just answer a little bit from my experience. We talk a little bit about this in the report. We actually got a chance to interview people who are sent both from the El Paso area where Linda works, um, and also from like the McAllen, Donna, area in the RGV, in the Rio Grande Valley. And there were some differences. Um, they're held in different places. And like, for example, it seemed as if in the RGV, um, Border Patrol actually gave um, folks less clear paperwork, un like less translated paperwork. So they didn't get some of the translated documents. So it was even harder for them to understand what was going on. They didn't get a, like a Spanish translation of this like, Especially, basically explanation of what the ACA is, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, even, even translated might have been too legalistic for them to understand really without a lawyer, because as Rachel said, this is very complicated. Um, um, and then another thing is the shackling issue that was mentioned. I mean, we did notice that there was, the people from El Paso were less often shackled than the people from RGV. So there were some kind of, I guess, process distinctions, but so, but we do know at least for sure that um, those two places were, were where people were, were put under the ACA in those two places. Does anybody have anything to add? I'll just mute for a sec. Only for to have the here being, oh, sorry, Ariana. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna uh, just clarify, like when Yael says shackled, what she's referring to is when people are put on the plane to send them to Guatemala, and mind you, these are asylum seekers who are exercising their legal rights to seek asylum, they're shackled or, or like their, their wrists are tied with like zip ties 
um, or something like that. So while the, while on the plane, sometimes. And only to to um, clarify that you're being metered in order to figure out whether or not you'll be placed into MPP or you know whatever program that the Trump administration is flirting with at the moment. So like Josue, for example, he he was um, when he was in Mexico, he had his own metering number, but he was also robbed. And so he lost that number and he had to start all over again. So he was in Juarez for quite some time and he was anticipating that he would be placed into NPP. He didn't really know about the ACA program until I had to tell him about it. Um, so that, that's also what's heartbreaking is that you're waiting for so long just to be placed into MPP and then, you know, your plans are skewed and suddenly you're on a plane to Guatemala. Okay, I'm going to ask these two uh, next questions to Rachel. Um, one is from, one asks about the temporary residence permit, uh, uh, that, the, that possibility in um, Guatemala and what that actually means. And Eric Olson asks, um, when were the last GACA transfers made? I can actually answer that. That was like March 16th, like mid-March, right when the COVID um, crisis started. Um, and then Eric asks, I've, I understand it's been since mid-March. Okay, so yeah. Has there been any effort on the part of Guatemalan or U.S. civil society to propose changes to the Guatemalan authorities to make the process in Guatemala minimally compliant with international obligations for protection and giving them access to legal representation, for example? If so, what has been um, the Guatemalan government's response? Um, and I think, I mean, may, may, maybe Rachel can best speak to this and others can, can follow it if, if wanted. Sure. So for the first question on temporary residency, um, that means that a, a Honduran or Salvadoran that applies for it can live legally in Guatemala. I, I believe it's up to five years. You have to keep renewing that residency and, and reapplying for it, but it's a legal status that, you know, you, you live legally in the country. I, I don't believe that it affords the same protections that like asylum would, but you are a legal resident. I think the biggest inhibitor for why people don't seek out that option is that you have to pay $500. Um, to go through that process. And, you know, as Maria Isabel mentioned in the video, she had no money. I think the majority of people that are sent to Guatemala under the ACA are really resource constrained. And so that $500 is a big deterrent as to why they would apply for that. And particularly since it doesn't afford the same types of options that um, of protection that asylum would. So that, that's a, for temporary residency. It's, it's an option, but we, I don't believe that anyone has applied for it as of yet. Um, and in terms of efforts on civil society, I know that Refugio de Niñez and the Human Rights Ombudsman's Office and even Casa de Migrante, the three sort of pillar organizations that are involved with this process, they've all spoken out saying that they have significant resource constraints, that it really should be the Guatemalan government that is assuming responsibility for these people, considering that they signed this agreement, and particularly since they signed it without any sort of input from these organizations. So there has been some vocal pushback from the organizations. Now, whether the power that they have is sufficient to really get the Guatemalan government to understand that, you know, is, it really depends. And I think the other issue is that, again, I don't want to get too technical with this, but Guatemalan government can't spend more than 1% of their state funds on this agreement. Otherwise, they have to get it ratified by the Congress. So in order for all these standards to be complied with, it probably is going to take some more money and more resources devoted to actually making this process work and comply. And the Guatemalan government literally has their hands tied in doing so unless they want to get it ratified through Congress. And they're not getting any support necessarily from U.S. funders on this either. So it's, you know, regardless of if civil society is calling for it, there's also some, you know, bureaucratic hurdles that have to be dealt with. Okay, I'll go on to the next question. Um, this is from Justine Tixton at um, Georgetown, the, one of the Georgetown law students who co-authored the report that's coming out next week that I mentioned in the opening. And basically it interviewed folks in about a month before we were there. So in January in 2020 rather than February when we were there and came to a lot of the similar findings about how the agreement really violates this non-refoulement and return um, obligation and that, you know, what we've been saying about Guatemala not having the full and fair procedures that are required. Um, 
And then I'll just read the second comment. Um, we show your major concerns about how the human rights and lives of asylum seekers are significantly endangered and can't help wondering what happens next for these, for these folks transferred who feel they have no choice but to return to their home countries because they cannot find protection in Guatemala. Or what happens when IOM deems them ineligible for a bus ride to their home country due to serious protection concerns. They are left sort of stranded and exposed in Guatemala itself. Where does the US envisage they find protection? Um, and, you know, so this is, I mean, I think, and I'll let each of the panelists speak to this, but I feel this is actually at the crux of what the problem is. I mean, sort of, this is not, you know, it's a dumping and it's externalization, right? We're just basically dumping people in a place where they are not going to be able to find protection, but I'll let each of our panelists sort of speak to this. Yeah, um, this policy is not about providing anyone with protection. The United States did not implement this policy. Guatemala is not a safe third country. It could not be considered a safe third country, um, it's, it, which makes this policy facially legal, right? Um, but yeah, it's just, it's important to note that, you know, I don't think the United States does envisage anyone as receiving protection. I think it's pretty clear that people are not receiving protection, that they don't have support, the support that they need. Um, and, you know, I think like Rachel mentioned earlier, there's no effort to track where um, people are going. So the vast majority of people are not, you know, applying for asylum in Guatemala within those 72 hours. And then they're essentially disappearing, either rejoining a perilous migratory route north or forced to return home where at the bare minimum they have, you know, family and, you know, other networks of support to sort of uh, reassess and, and recover from you know, the financial loss that they've experienced uh, from, from seeking asylum in the first place. I mean, people take out loans to travel, they sell their houses, they leave everything behind because it's really an emergency and they really have to go, you know, it's not, it's not sort of like, well, I'm just going to move, <laughs> you know, for fun. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's not about protection at all. I mean, just to, to second Ariana's comment, it, the question presupposes that the US government devised something and had some kind of vision and a game plan for asylum seekers to keep them safe, but it, it's, it's all just a farce. It, it really is just non-refoulement. It's just refoulement with another name to it. Uh, I completely agree. I don't have too much more to add. I think that's why the report name speaks for itself, you know, deportation with a layover. There's really no intention of having people stay in Guatemala. I don't think anyone in the United States government really believed that this was going to be an effective protection for them. Uh, one thing I will say about, you know, what happens next is that it's incredibly important, and I know we have some like, journalists and stuff in the audience, like to actually, if we could get stories of what, pe what happens to people when they return, like th those things are incredibly powerful to know. And unfortunately, again, neither the Guatemalan government nor the US government are actually doing that tracking. So it's really up to non-government actors to, you know, again, take up this responsibility to find out what's going on. Um, and then I think only then can we really start tracking with what's happening, unfortunately. Just add one other thing. Um, you know, we have a report at Human Rights Watch that came out somewhat recently about um, the, like what happens when people with bona fide fear uh, concert claims are returned to El Salvador. So when people who were trying to seek asylum are denied asylum and then deported to El Salvador by the United States and we found um, uh, people are murdered, they're sexually assaulted, they've been tortured. I mean, so, you know, the results of, of violating the principle of non-refoulement in this case, it's predictably, uh, catastrophic, I think. So I think although there's no, um, we don't have a way of monitoring or the government, which, you know, should be responsible for, for monitoring, um, has, hasn't done so. And so there is no monitoring happen. I think we can say with some certainty that people are going to get hurt or are being hurt. 
I think that kind of relates to some of the um, questions sort of at the bottom of the list um, about have our organizations tried to use sort of international systems like the Inter-American um, Human Rights um, System or the UN? How, how much role does like the UN or, you know, the international organizations? So if, if the governments aren't monitoring what's happening, is this something that um, perhaps these other um, organizations might do? And I think, you know, the Inter-American and human rights system um, does, has done sort of inquiries into the Remain in Mexico program, for example, and it is something that it's certainly something that we would consider raising um, with them um, as something to look into, sort of to investigate and to raise up. I um, mean, in terms of the UN, um, so the UNHCR. Um, if you if you if you look in our report, and I know there's some folks possibly from the UNHCR on. on, on here listening. Um, you know, HDR, you know, has some partners work with those, some of the organizations Rachel talked about in Guatemala. The, the very little statistical information that we do have that basically the UNHCR was able to interview some people um, and what, what they were basically able to, to, to really figure out was that these people have, you know, real international protection needs that aren't being met. But after that, no, I mean, the, the issue is, you know, the UNHCR can't hold people and can't make them sort of um, follow up. And so the question really is, um, you know, whose responsibility is it? to, um, pro, you know, to make sure that these folks do not fall into harm. And, you know, UNHCR, again, is trying to do it, but it's, it's really, it's the Guatemalan government and the U.S. government that has signed this, these agreements to, you know, facilitate this transfer. So I, I, I do think the UNHCR does have a role, but I think UNHCR has been reluctant to say, okay, we'll facilitate this. You know, I mean, that's the last thing that they would want to do. So it, the question then becomes sort of how do you, um, hold the governments accountable and say, why aren't you monitoring it? But I'll let the others sort of answer this question about the role that perhaps, um, you know, international governmental um, organizations could play here. I'll just piggyback a little bit off of Yael's point. And just, I would just want to emphasize that again, like when this agreement was being negotiated, you know, UNHCR publicly came out against this agreement because it's a bad agreement. And, you know, once the, once the UNHCR came out again, you know, saying that this was not a great, this, this was a bad decision. And not that they said that exactly, but you know, a lot of people fall through the cracks because once it's, there's not any monitoring in the same way that like the Canada, agreement is a third country agreement is where you have UN um, organizations that are tasked with that. I think the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems with this agreement is that there's no delineation of who's responsible for what, when, who pays for what. And so when that happens, people get left behind and fall through the cracks. So I don't know about the Inter-American, maybe other colleagues want to speak to other UN bodies. So it hasn't yet been brought to, to international courts or tribunals or anything like that. I would say that, you know, as Rachel did say, the UN has come out against it publicly or has, has worried that this agreement is actually leading to reformment, a violation of international law. Um, and I mean, I think, I mean, we spoke, I spoke a little bit about the litigation. I mean, I think the way to really hold the U.S., the United States has incorporated into its own law the international obligation um, in the UN um, Treaty on the Rights of Refugees, the, this obligation not to return people to harm, this non refoulement obligation. So we can actually hold the U.S. government to that standard in U.S. courts. It is part of our law. Uh, and I think that's really what the goal of the litigation is. But that doesn't mean that, you know, international, we cannot raise this up um, to the Inter-American Commission, for example, um, to do an investigation and to, and to protest these things. That's some of the other, other things that we, we can consider. Um, I think we're out of time because the, the questions have been, are gone. So um, thank you all for participating and for joining this uh, webinar. Um, and I hope you come to future um, uh, Voices from the Border events. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.